Hello, and welcome back to What is Politics? Over the last two episodes, we've been doing some political anthropology with the aim of understanding hierarchy and equality in human societies. We've been trying to see why some societies have almost total equality, where no one dominates anyone else, everyone has equal access to resources, and is even entitled to those resources. And why other societies have extreme dominance hierarchies, where some people have almost all the decision-making power, and other people have almost none. And we saw that ultimately, it boils down to bargaining power, where conditions are such that some people are in a position to dominate others, and these conditions last long enough, you end up with a society with dominance hierarchies and political and cultural institutions and values that reinforce and stabilize those dominance hierarchies. And if conditions are such that no one is in a position to dominate anyone else, you end up with an egalitarian society and institutions that reinforce and stabilize equality and individual autonomy, which is the case for those immediate return hunting and gathering societies that we've been looking at. Now, a materialist behavioral ecology perspective like this can seem very deterministic, that people have no choice but to organize in certain ways in certain conditions, and people tend to think it leaves no room for human agency or values or ideas. It makes human beings seem quite mechanical. This is the old idealism versus materialism debate. Idealism is the idea that our social structures and political institutions are the result of our ideas and values and culture, And materialism is the idea that our social structures, our political institutions, and our culture and values are the result of material, environmental, and practical conditions. In 19th century terms, does history make men, or do men make history? Now this isn't just some kind of esoteric philosophical debate, and this podcast is not about being a big wank fest. The point of this show is for us to figure out how to become effective political actors. And the reason we're spending a lot of time talking about materialism is because it has such important real-world applications, and because there are such stark consequences for political actors who don't have an understanding of things like the material incentives built into their political systems. Making change in politics is all about expanding your coalition and finding the right allies. One of the main advantages of materialist analysis is that it helps us predict human behavior things like who is likely to be a good potential ally, and who's likely to be a wolf in sheep's clothing, pretending to be an ally for a nefarious reason. And equally important, an understanding of material dynamics in politics helps us become more intelligent about designing good policies, good institutions, and good political systems, versus laws that have unintended consequences, or that are ignored and unenforced, or political reforms that get reversed after a few years or a few decades, or else revolutions where the new system becomes as bad as the system that it replaced. And so, in this episode, we're going to look at some of the different ways that social change happens. And then we'll see how not having a proper understanding of your political context, or the material and practical conditions that your struggle is taking place in, can lead to disaster, even when material conditions are on your side. And conversely, we'll see how sometimes material conditions are so overwhelming that they can just push forward social change all by themselves, even when revolutionaries bungle and fail. So we'll be looking at women in Western countries fighting for the right to vote, black Americans fighting for legal equality, the massive English Peasants' Revolt of 1381, and the anarchist revolution in Spain in the 1930s. Human beings have agency, meaning we have the ability to act and make decisions based on what's in our heads and our hearts. But at the same time, different people often make similar decisions in similar situations. The less restrictive the situation is, the more room there is for things like free will and individual or cultural proclivities and values to express themselves. But the more restrictive and the more extreme conditions become, the more our choices become predictable. And this includes which values we choose to adhere to, to adopt, and to pass on to our children, or which values we choose to inherit or to reject from our parents. If those extreme restrictive conditions recur often enough over a long period of time, or if they stay restrictive over time, you either adopt specific values and make specific choices, or you and your culture will die. I'll go back to the example of the weather, because it's so simple. When the weather outside is room temperature, you have the choice of wearing almost anything you want. A bikini, a three-piece snoot, a baseball uniform, Mardi Gras costume, 
Your agency and proclivities have room to express themselves. But if it's minus 30 degrees outside, you still theoretically have the choice of wearing whatever you want, but your agency is basically limited to whether you want to live or die of cold, and to experiment to try to find the warmest combination of materials and clothes possible. If your culture has values that are incompatible with these extreme conditions, like if you move into a climate where it's always minus 30 degrees outside, and your culture values nudity above all, so that we can remain as close as possible to how God intended for us to be seen, for example, you will have to change your values and come up with some religious excuses for wearing full snowsuit gear. And if you don't, everyone who insists on clinging to the old values will be wiped out. Last time, we talked about how patrilocal post-marriage residence rules, where women who are getting married leave their native area to go live with their husband's people, give men a bargaining power advantage over women, and how this leads to male-dominated societies. And we saw that cultures tend to adopt this type of residence pattern when they're subject to frequent attacks, because having your village or your mobile lineage group be organized around closely related males who grew up together and who know each other well is good for snap defense. And as a result of this, you end up with social groups where all the men know each other since childhood, but all the adult women come from different villages or lineages, and are therefore more socially isolated. So if there's ever a conflict between a man and a woman, the man has the whole village likely to take his side, and the woman hardly has anyone. And over time, this leads to male dominance and patriarchal ideology, as we saw last time. Now there's also such thing as matrilocal post-marriage residence, and it's the second most common rule out of the six existing rule types that we mentioned last time. Cultures will adopt a matrilocal residence rule when the economy involves a lot of long-distance hunting, fishing, or warfare, and raiding that involves men going off for long expeditions for long periods, often months at a time. Because the men are away for prolonged periods, women are the ones who have to take care of things like land management, politics, agriculture, and other village affairs. So it makes sense to have villages organized around women who grew up together and who know each other well. This way, they'll have less conflict and be better at resolving disagreements when it comes to decisions involving land management and village politics, versus if you had villages made up of women who didn't know each other well. But people don't just do things because they make sense. There's also the reality of bargaining power involved. Whenever anyone says anything like, this society chooses this or that, keep in mind that it's extremely rare for a society as a whole to all choose something in unison. Society chooses this or that means that some members of society manage to get their way versus other people who probably didn't want that particular thing. Because people have different material and psychological interests, and different classes of people have different class interests. In episode 3, we looked at a hypothetical situation where you could have a magical free healthcare system for everyone, with all the best doctors and the best care possible, just by saying mecha leka hai, mecha hai ho. And although this would be the best healthcare system imaginable in the universe, there would be a tiny class of people who own lots of medical insurance company stock, and they would lose out. And they would oppose this new system. And if that tiny class of people were powerful enough, they could maintain the existing garbage system, even though it's terrible for 99.9% .9 of the population. So although it makes the best sense to adopt matrilocal residence when men are away for long periods, Having villages based on related women takes some power away from men. And men, or people, don't usually like giving up power when they don't have to. So we would expect that men might resist. But the fact that men are away for so long gives women the increased bargaining power that's necessary to insist on and impose and fight for and win that kind of post-marital residence rule on the men. So people make choices and people actively engage in struggles. But conditions will help decide, and sometimes even determine, who the winner of those struggles will be, and what the resulting social order will look like. And that's more true the more restrictive conditions are. And for a society to thrive, it needs stability. So culture and values adapt to reflect and stabilize the long-term balance of power of a society, and to maintain cohesion. So for example, among the people of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in North America, aka the Iroquois, who are traditionally matrilocal and matrilineal, women are enormously respected. And unlike in the West, where surveys show that men of all ages tend to find 22-year-old women to be the most attractive, or in Japan, where the ideal age of physical attractiveness for women has been going down over the years, from early 20s to high school to middle school, 
women in Haudenosaunee cultures are considered to be the most attractive in their late 30s and their 40s, much like men at that age are considered to be attractive in Western societies compared to 22-year-olds. And this makes sense, because women of that age were at a high point in terms of their influence and political power, just like men of that age tend to be wealthier in our society. So by marrying someone in that position, you're getting a better setup for your kids and your family life. You'll often hear people who come from the Six Nations say that there was no such thing as sexual assault or rape in traditional Haudenosaunee societies. And whether that's exactly right or not, it's certainly very likely that it was extremely rare, not only because of their values, but also because of the practical reality that any man who did anything like that would be ostracized by the entire village and be left alone to die. A society where women lead family and political life, and where villages consist of related women who've known each other since childhood, does not take kindly to sexual assault. People who don't like material explanations of culture and politics argue that this idea of culture adapting to material reality is just mystical and that no one can explain how it works. People don't just magically adapt to things, we make choices based on our values and our intelligence and our assessment of situations and our feelings. But again, regardless of our feelings and our values, our choices become more and more predictable the more restrictive that conditions get. And one of these choices is which cultural values we choose to adopt. In his very important book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn noticed that the theories and worldviews of older established scientists dominate in their fields. Even when new evidence shows that their favorite theories are wrong, until those scientists retire, and younger scientists who came up while the old theories were being disproven start to take over. And this is very much how culture works as well. Imagine that you had a patriarchal culture where men tend to have very misogynist attitudes towards women. And the people of that culture end up moving into a new environment where they now have to adopt an economy that involves long distance hunting and raiding. And women, by necessity, are in the village running political life. And a debate begins about switching to matrilocal versus patrilocal residents. And the women win because they're right and because they have the advantage. Well, the older men might still have misogynist ideas, but now women have more and more power to make their life hell if the men treat them with disrespect. So now, young men growing up can see that their father's attitudes are out of step with reality, and they just seem old and foolish. Plus, their mothers, who are now in a strong position, won't continue to pass on patriarchal values to their kids anymore. So the kids are growing up with competing values to choose from, and they'll tend to choose the ones that make the most sense. And I'll give you a funny example of this phenomenon from my family in the upcoming Q&A episode. Interestingly, Matrilocal residence doesn't seem to lead to the same degree of female dominance that men end up having over women in patriarchal societies. For example, women usually won't totally monopolize all the positions of authority, the way men do, and they don't subjugate the men into doing all the dirty work for them while they hang around with their pals, which we see in some more extreme patriarchal societies. Among the people of the Haudenosaunee, you traditionally had a system where the eldest woman of each clan was the clan mother, and the ultimate authority of that clan but the clan mothers together elected the chief, who was always a man. One theory for why this is the case is that men usually dominate war and fighting, so this tends to give them higher bargaining power than women usually have in patrilocal societies, where they can be physically overpowered by the coalition of men on top of being socially isolated by the logistics of patrilocal residents. In the future, we'll talk more about the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which was surprisingly egalitarian for such a large sedentary agricultural society. The point of this is that matrilocal residence and increased women's rights and power is another example of social structure being determined by material conditions. Men being away for long periods gives women more bargaining power, which leads to more rights for women. So again, people have agency, but they also tend to make somewhat predictable choices over the long run. Now in Western industrialized societies, we can see something that at first glance appears to be a similar dynamic at work when we look at how women got the right to vote. But when we look closer, we see something very different happening. If you just go on Wikipedia and look up women's suffrage, you'll find a list of when women won the right to vote in different countries. And you'll notice that for Europe and North America, all the dates mostly hover around either the end of World War I or else World War II. The story of how women got the right to vote is a little different in each country. But the fact that it happens for all these countries around the time of the big world wars is not coincidental. 
like with the Haudenosaunee, where women had increased bargaining power because men were away raiding or hunting. In World War I and World War II, women got more bargaining power because working-age men were away for long stretches, and women were needed to replace them as laborers. But women in Europe and North America got the right to vote after the war was over, when material conditions had returned to normal. The men were back in the village, permanently, so to speak. So a change in material conditions doesn't really explain what happened. In this case, particularly in England, Canada, and the United States, the change in women's rights was largely a result of a change in consciousness among women, but also among men. And this change in consciousness caught up with changes in conditions that had already happened before, but went unnoticed. Like how people sometimes decide to quit their hated job or leave an abusive relationship after they've had a vacation or time away from their spouse that makes them realize that they don't need to put up with this crap anymore. In this case, the material conditions which gave women the bargaining power necessary for them to get the right to vote had already been there for some time, but people didn't realize it yet, so they weren't willing to work for it. Women are more than 50% of the population, and unlike in other societies, like the Lacey that we talked about last time, where women are physically isolated from each other, women in North America had the ability to meet together, especially as urbanization increased. Unbeknownst to them, they'd had this power in urban centers for decades, and in rural areas, they were getting this power more and more as the telephone became more affordable and more common. But in order to activate that latent bargaining power, they needed to know that they had that power. They needed to have a common goal. They needed to be able to make alliances with other women, and they needed to know how to effectively push for those goals. In terms of a unified goal, the majority of women generally already wanted the right to vote and had wanted it for decades. But although there were suffragette organizations in the U.S. dating back to the 1870s, women weren't joining them in great numbers. But once women entered the workforce, several things happened. One is that women began to feel more entitled to equal voting rights, as they understood that the war couldn't have been won without them. Another is that the mystique of men's work was shattered. Now if a husband would try to get his way on some disagreement or other by invoking the I work hard all day and I wah 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 argument, the woman could now say, I did everything you do for four years, and I came home and took care of the kids, so don't think you're some kind of martyr just because you go to work. Crucially, the fact of being out in the workforce brought women together in a way that wasn't the case when they were more isolated at home taking care of children. So people got to speak to each other and know each other and share their experiences on lunch breaks or after work, social events. And they shared their grievances and their ideas, and they became aware that there was a whole nation of other women thinking the same things and having the same needs and wants. And in this way, they became more aware of their bargaining power and of being a political force. So they gained a sense of entitlement and also a sense of their own power. There was also the idea that if women had had the right to vote from the get-go, maybe the senseless, unnecessary deaths of millions of people in World War I could have been avoided altogether. So there was a fresh and tangible argument for why their voices were crucial. Suddenly, suffragettes organizations started ballooning in number and membership, and now experienced organizers had the numbers they needed to put effective pressure on politicians and other influential people. And more numbers also meant more creative ideas on how to apply pressure and how to gain influence. And they did this using the full spectrum of pressure and PR tactics, from traditional lobbying to picketing, parades, mass meetings, posters, parties, advertisements, hunger strikes, and civil disobedience, targeting everyone from their husbands to individual members of Congress or Parliament, and generating publicity by getting arrested for picketing and following around the president or the prime ministers. The American suffragettes also made a huge issue of pointing out how the U.S. was fighting for democracy abroad while keeping women disenfranchised at home. And historically, we see again and again that lower-ranking classes in society rise up effectively when they have large networks and can form coalitions that assert their will and defend their interests. For example, slaves in the United States rarely managed to carry out successful slave rebellions. American slave revolts tended to be isolated to one owner or one plantation and involved some violence against the masters and then the slaves would all get killed by the authorities. Meanwhile, in Haiti, which at the time was called Saint-Domingue, slaves managed to overthrow the entire government and take control of the island. The big difference was that slaves in the United States were much more isolated into small groups, controlled by owners of single homes and plantations. Meanwhile, in Saint-Domingue, although slaves were worked to death on giant plantations, they were still able to meet together at night in ritual societies that had networks across the country. And it was via these networks that slaves were able to get an understanding of their opponents, of the system, of goings-on in different parts of the country. And that's where they were able to form bonds and solidarity with each other, all of which you need to effectively make change. Another important factor that raised consciousness in Canada, the U.S., and England 
was the fact that women were getting the right to vote in the new nations that were created in the aftermath of World War I, like Austria and Hungary. This gave women a further sense that they deserved this, and it also helped focus media attention on that particular issue. The reason that women in those newly formed countries got the right to vote was similar to what happened in the Anglo countries, but there was an added bonus that made their job easier. When you're starting from scratch, it's easier to have a say in how a new political system will work versus when you already have an established political system with an entrenched hierarchy and a creaky, difficult constitution to deal with, like you notoriously have in the United States, for example. And in the Anglo countries, as everywhere, it wasn't just women's consciousness that was raised. An increasing number of men, and politicians, who after all were the ones who had the power to vote, recognized the contributions that women had made during the war, and they recognized that women could do all the same jobs that men can do, and that they had all the same abilities that men had. And these facts were brought to their attention again and again by women's organizing efforts, and news of voting rights being won by women in newly formed nations. So whereas some women had been organizing for the right to vote for decades, it was the consciousness raised by the experience of World War I, and in some countries World War II, that pushed these movements over the edge into mass participation and success. Now if you look at that Wikipedia page on women's suffrage, you'll notice that while women got the right to vote everywhere else in Europe in World War I, and in a few places in World War II, women in Switzerland only got full voting rights in 1971. It's no coincidence that Switzerland did not fight in World War I or World War II. If you read academic articles about it, the late enfranchisement of Swiss women is usually attributed to things like class divisions in the women's movement and lack of support from political parties. But those very same factors were overcome in the other countries. The fact is that Swiss women simply did not have the same experiences or the expanded social networks which had been the case in the other European countries as the result of the war. It wasn't until the time of the sexual revolution, which was catalyzed by the availability of birth control and which was visible to everyone via mass media which was now in everyone's homes, that enough Swiss women were finally motivated enough to win full voting rights. In Scandinavian countries, which were largely agricultural economies, women's work wasn't so obviously segregated from men's work, so the importance of their work and the equality of its importance to men's work was more obvious to women and men alike. And you also had more of a socialist tradition which had been advocating gender equality since the mid-19th century. So even though Sweden was neutral in World War I, the success of suffrage movements in nearby countries that did fight in the war was enough to motivate Swedish women to push for their rights. The story is similar for the black civil rights movement in the United States, which not coincidentally emerged with much greater force after World War II. In World War I, and in earlier wars, black soldiers were mostly support troops doing menial labor jobs with a few exceptional black battalions. But in World War II, because of the greater need for troops, black Americans were drafted along with everybody else. 1.2 million black men went to Europe as soldiers, as specialists, as officers, to fight and die in a war against racism and genocide, only to return to the same racism, discrimination, and exploitation at home. The hypocrisy was stinkingly obvious. Meanwhile on the home front, black men and black women, just like white women, entered new professions and labor markets as the war created an enormous labor shortage. So now, black men and women were working better jobs, joining unions, getting access to more advanced skills and training, and working under better conditions than had previously been available to them. Exposure to better conditions, higher bargaining power, and the hypocrisy of democratic rhetoric of the US government's war effort versus the reality of second-class citizenship at home led to greater consciousness, confidence, entitlement, social networks, and unified purpose. And thus, the double V movement emerged, where black people fought for victory against fascism and racism abroad and at home. And like the suffragettes, they employed all the tactics of pressure and PR available to them. Energized mobilization and activism by black soldiers, veterans, and their organizations led to President Roosevelt passing ordinances to end discrimination in Defense Department jobs. But it took a much longer battle to get full legal civil rights in the rest of the economy and in the country particularly in the southern states where racism was so deeply embedded in cultural identity and in the economy. Another factor in why black legal equality was more of an uphill battle than female legal equality was the simple fact that most of the majoritarian white people were not exposed to the struggles of black people or subject to pressure from them the way that men were exposed to the gripes and pressure tactics of women. Like almost every man has a close relationship with at least one or two different women, at least their mother or sister or their wife. Far fewer white people had relationships with black people, aside from some soldiers and some recently and temporarily integrated wartime workplaces. 
So white consciousness was much slower to change than male consciousness was in regards to women's rights. It's not coincidental that support for black rights was higher among the military, where black soldiers had gained reputations for being courageous and capable, and had earned the respect of their white brothers who sometimes joined them in their protest actions. Regardless of these setbacks, it was World War II veterans who were at the heart of the civil rights activism in the 1950s, which finally was victorious in obtaining legal equality in the 1960s. In these cases, the black civil rights movement and the women's suffrage movement, a change of consciousness alone, was enough to make a big difference, because the bargaining power of those groups was already there. They just weren't using it. They hadn't figured out that they'd had it or how to use it yet. Unless the changes and conditions are overwhelmingly in your favor and glaringly obvious, raising consciousness and having an awareness of the conditions around you and of things like the material incentives inherent in your political system is key to making social change. You need to know these things in order to know who your potential allies are, who to trust, who to be skeptical of, and how to fight off opposition. A spectacular example of how material conditions affect bargaining power and why knowledge and political awareness are key to capitalizing on that bargaining power is the great English Peasants' Revolt of 1381. When the Western Roman Empire fell in the 4th century, warlords emerged who would gain wealth by pillaging local farmers who had no Roman Empire around to keep order. This gave warlords enormous bargaining power over farmers to whom they could offer protection quote unquote, in exchange for a large part of the peasants' harvests. Over time, the warlords just became plain old lords, and the farmers became serfs. Eventually, kings emerged who unified larger territories. One of the ways that kings consolidated their power was by offering nobility protection from rebellion by their serfs. So the states that these kings created had as a main function to keep themselves and the noble elite in power. At the same time, kings also leveraged popular support to keep the nobility in check. Because like anyone, nobility don't like having someone rule over them. So there was a carrot and stick approach. While monarchs gained support from the nobility by helping enforce their power over the serfs, they also gained support from the population by protecting the serfs against the excesses and arbitrary rules of their lords, thus gaining them a measure of popular legitimacy. So for example in England, the lords made the law and operated their own courts, which meant that the serfs could never get any justice if they had a dispute versus their lord. Heads I win, tails you lose. But once kings were established, they operated courts called the King's Bench, which would travel around the country and hear appeals of cases decided by the Lord's Court. And thus serfs could sometimes get some justice versus the Lord's. Meanwhile, the King was also propped up by religious indoctrination from the Church, which in turn was propped up by the King. So people believed that the King was appointed by God, and he cared about them. And if they got mad at authority figures, it was usually at the local authorities, the lord whose fist was readily visible, versus the king's hidden fist, supporting the lord behind the scenes. It's a bit like today, where you have a capitalist workplace with an owner and managers. Often the managers are the ones doing all of the abuse and the dirty work, and they have all of the coercive interactions with their workers, while the owner acts like a benevolent leader above the clouds, always having very friendly interactions with the workers those few times when he interacts with them at all. As a result, owners usually have a much better reputation than their direct managers do, even though the owner is the one telling the managers what to do and how to abuse the workers. And in American politics, Republicans tend to act like and be supported by owners, while Democrats tend to act like and be supported by managers. And so serfdom trudges along for hundreds of years, and the trend was lords extracting more and more surplus from the serf class over time. But... Then the Black Plague gets to England in 1348 and 1349, and then again in 1362 and 1369. And this kills 40 to 60% of the population, disproportionately serfs. And this horrible nightmare becomes a partial blessing for the surviving serfs, as well as for urban laborers, as it radically changes the balance of power between serfs and nobility, the same way a labor shortage changes the balance of power between employers and employees today. Suddenly, many lords didn't have enough serfs to keep them in the riches to which they were accustomed, and they would try to poach serfs from other lords by offering them better conditions, even though this was illegal and considered highly scandalous. For the first time, serfs were in a position to demand better conditions from their own lords, and they insisted on paying less of their harvest to their lords, demanding higher wages for side jobs, insisting on the right to do better paid skilled labor that they were normally barred from doing, and they wanted to pay less in the various onerous fees that they were obligated to give to their lords. By the 1380s, the purchasing power of rural laborers had increased by around 
all at the expense of the nobility. And of course, the nobility were losing their minds. They tried in vain to reassert their bargaining power by using the power of the state to impose laws which attempted to fix wages at pre-plague levels. They made it a crime to refuse work or to break an existing contract, and they imposed branding and imprisonment as punishment. Parliament enacted sumptuary laws to prevent serfs from buying and wearing expensive goods formerly affordable only to the nobility, and they made laws preventing serfs from sending their children to school. But despite these efforts, and despite the power of the state, the material conditions, i.e. the labor shortage, were such that the laws could only be enforced so far, and the advancement of the serfs could only be slowed down so much. Lords needed workers, so they kept trying to entice them to stay. The rising power of the serfs brought with it expectations, and a sense that they deserved better, and mounting resentment that laws were being used to prevent them from attaining their due. So the change in material conditions was clear, and this changed consciousness. Soon enough, new radical ideas started spreading about how the nobility were useless and parasitical class. When Adam delved and Eve span, who is then a gentleman, was the famous slogan of John Ball, who was the most prominent of a new generation of radical priests. And by this he meant, there were no nobility in biblical times, God didn't create them, so why should there be any now? Quote, From the beginning all men by nature were created alike, and our bondage or servitude came in by the unjust oppression of naughty men. For if God would have had any bondmen from the beginning, he would have appointed who should be bond and who should be free. And therefore I exhort you to consider that now the time is come, appointed to us by God, in which ye may, if ye will, cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. And like in so many revolts and revolutions, the idea of liberty was intimately tied up with the notion of equality, because it's only when people have material and political equality that no one is in any position to dominate anyone else which is the necessary precondition for liberty. My good friends, began another one of Ball's famous sermons, matters cannot go well in England, nor ever will, until all the things shall be held in common, when there shall be neither vassals nor lords, when the lords shall be no more masters than ourselves. And for thirty years priests like John Ball and other radicals agitated and organized and made connections between serfs and townspeople who felt the waning power of the nobility and their own power growing. And the idea grew that if people took action, they could actually return to the classless world that God had intended. So changing conditions generated changes in consciousness, which people used to organize and change consciousness further, with the aim of changing society and eliminating the noble class altogether, in order to establish England as a federation of independent communes. So you basically had a straight-up Christian libertarian socialist movement brewing almost 500 years before Karl Marx or Mikhail Bakunin. And finally, after decades of being jailed and branded and burned, and as further resentment grew after successive rounds of taxes were imposed by Parliament to pay for the Hundred Years' War with France, in 1381, England exploded in rebellion, as peasants, along with artisans and rural officials, revolted against the nobility and the government. But unlike other peasant revolts that flared up around Europe at different times, this one was organized. The rebels knew exactly what they wanted and how they wanted it. They wanted the end of serfdom, the end of privileges for the nobility, to be free of onerous war taxes, the end of maximum wages and other laws artificially enforcing class distinctions, to depose the king's senior officials and to set up a nation of independent communes. And so, they went from town to town, burning records, opening jails and killing hated figures, tax collectors, specific government officials, clergy and nobles, with the aim of achieving this goal. They targeted the feared and hated manorial rules, which listed the crimes that people had committed, and how much they owed in taxes. And eventually, an army of 140,000 peasants marched up to London. And with the king's armies mostly away fighting the war in France, they were poised to easily take the Tower of London, and to depose King Richard II, who was only 14 years old at the time. But, as intelligent and as organized as the rebellion was, the peasant rebels did not understand the nature and the dynamics of the political system that kept them subjugated. They naively believed that the king was their protector, appointed by God, and that the noble class alone was the cause of their oppression. And they didn't understand how the king worked with the nobility to keep the serfs working under the dominance of the ruling class. Their slogan was, For King Richard and the True Commons. The king was appointed by God, and they wanted a direct relationship with him, without the corrupt nobility and high clergy in the way. It's a bit like how Republicans in the U.S. look at Donald Trump. He's the good guy. It's all those corrupt people around him that ruin everything for us. 
Luckily for the ruling class, the king's advisors very much understood how their political system worked, and they realized that they could benefit from the peasants' ignorance. And so, they got the king to go out and to pretend that he was actually on the peasants' side. And King Richard made all their fantasies come true, telling them that he was going to implement all of their demands, and even signing charters to that effect. The satisfied peasants went home with stars in their eyes, believing that a new era was about to begin. Instead, what did begin was a bloodbath, as the king's troops came home and went after them a week later, slaughtering them in their beds in a massacre that lasted for several days. And if you think today's kids are bad, get a load of the mouth on 14-year-old King Richard. Serfs you have been, and serfs you shall remain in bondage, not such as you have hitherto been subjected to, but incomparably viler. For so long as we live and rule by God's grace over this kingdom, we shall use our strength, sense, and property to treat you that your slavery may be an example to posterity and to those who live now and hereafter, who may be like you, may always have before their eyes, as it were in a glass, your misery and reasons for cursing you and the fear of doing things like those which you have done. Now that is class consciousness. So despite having a long-term vision, having intelligent short-term tactics, having tactical advantages and plans which were actually successful, the simple fact of not understanding the material interests of the king and knowing which side he would come down on doomed the rebellion. But there's more to the story of the English peasants. Despite being massacred, and despite the king's promise to make life hell for them and their descendants for all eternity, life actually improved for the peasants over the next decades. The fact is that the material conditions that gave rise to the peasants' increased power, the labor shortage, was still there. And thus the defeated peasants still had a natural bargaining power advantage, even though they lost the extra advantage that they had by organizing and by their targeted attacks. And on top of that, by successfully organizing to the point of almost toppling the entire monarchy, the peasants put the fear of God in the king and the nobility in parliament, that this could happen again if the peasants were provoked too hard. So wages still went up, and grain dues and other onerous obligations still went down. So whereas one of the triggers of the 1381 rebellion was a poll tax, in 1382 a new poll tax was ordered by parliament, but this time for landowners only. In 1390, the attempts at maximum wage laws were abandoned. And by 1430, villainage, which tied serfs to the lands of their particular lord, was abolished. Now 550 years later, another group of peasants, together with urban workers, had another uprising with similar goals as the English peasants overthrow the dominant elite, and establish an order of free communes, with property held in common for the benefit of all. In this case, the dominant elites were urban business owners, rural landlords, and the state, which enforced their domination. And unlike the English peasants in 1381, these peasants and urban workers had a much better understanding of their political system. And as a result, their revolution was actually successful, at least for a time. The anarchist revolution in Spain, which happened during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939, was in my opinion one of the most important episodes in human history. Here, for the first time in the industrialized world, people successfully replaced the existing political, economic, and cultural hierarchies of the day with a system of radical democracy, economic equality, and even a high degree of gender equality, which is shocking given that Spain in the 1930s was a traditional Catholic patriarchal culture for elites and peasants and urban workers alike. Where others had repeatedly failed, the Spanish revolutionaries actually achieved the supposedly impossible dream of establishing a society run by its own people, without capitalism, but also without an oppressive state power enforcing equality. In other words, socialism without a state, i.e. libertarian socialism or libertarian communism. And despite this, or rather because of it, it's also one of the most neglected episodes of human history. From the end of the war in 1939 until the 1970s, there was almost nothing published about it in academia, popular journalism, or popular literature. Even during the war, there wasn't much discussion of it outside of Spain, though George Orwell, who fought with one of the socialist militias, wrote a book about it called Homage to Catalonia. Even today, if you look up the Spanish Civil War, you often won't see the anarchist revolution mentioned at all, or else it'll be mentioned in passing. 
In the Cold War context, you had capitalist political and economic inequality, justified by the idea that the only alternative is Soviet-style dictatorship. And on the other side, you had state socialist economies, justifying their dictatorships as the only way to avoid the economic, racial, gender, and colonial inequalities of the capitalist world. And so, you didn't have many people in the private for-profit capitalist media, or the Communist Party state-controlled media, eager to let people know that the foundational basis for their respective oppressive economic and political systems was simply not true, and that it actually was possible to have freedom and equality at the same time. Now in Spain, libertarian socialists, known as anarchists, had been proselytizing and organizing workers and peasants since the 1870s. And unlike Marxist socialism, which mostly appealed to urban intellectuals and urban laborers rather than peasants, because Marxists tended to see peasants as a backwards anti-revolutionary force, the libertarian wing of socialism had massive support among peasants and wage workers alike. And while there were urban intellectuals in the anarchist movement, they didn't dominate the movement the same way that they tended to do in Marxist parties. One of the big material reasons for the popularity of anarchist socialism among Spanish peasants was that unlike in other countries, where peasants were small landholders, Spanish agriculture land was still organized into latifundia, a holdover from ancient Roman times, where a powerful aristocrat owned huge swaths of land worked by tenant farmers. So in Marxist terms, Spanish peasants were like a rural proletariat, meaning people who owned nothing but their own labor and some personal possessions and would have the least to lose and the most to gain from a reorganization of society along socialist lines. By the early 20th century, anarchists had become the leading force in the labor movement in many parts of the country, and they'd organized massive labor unions with millions of members, which not only organized urban workers, but also peasants. Unlike the types of labor unions that we're familiar with today, whose ambitions are limited to fighting for more workers' rights and higher wages, these anarchist unions also had the long-term goal of taking over industry and society entirely to replace capitalist owners and the state at the same time, and have workers and farmers run society directly in a democratic fashion, a form of government called anarcho-syndicalism. In 1931, the King of Spain authorized democratic elections to decide the next government, and voters overwhelmingly chose Republican and moderate socialist parties that wanted to get rid of the monarchy and establish a republic. Then, in 1936, a leftist coalition was elected to government, and in response, right-wing army officers led by Francisco Franco orchestrated a coup to restore power to traditional Spanish elites, like landlords, the church, and large business owners. The coup succeeded in the more conservative parts of Spain, but in the rest of the country, democratic capitalists, socialists, and anarchists managed to stymie the conservative takeover, and they formed a coalition, usually referred to as the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War. But calling it the Republican side was a misnomer, as the anarchists were not interested in establishing a republic. They wanted a federation of self-governing communes, much like the peasants did in 1381. And like the peasants in 1381, who took advantage of the fact that the English army was away fighting in France, the Spanish anarchist organizations took advantage of the failed fascist coup, of the civil war, and of the loss of legitimacy and authority of the Spanish state to launch their revolution. Workers in cities launched strikes and seized factories of fascist-supporting owners who had fled or who had been assassinated or exiled. In these newly worker-controlled enterprises, workers elected their management and had meetings to set their own hours and wages and prices. And because there wasn't someone sucking out profit at the top, they were generally able to lower their work hours, raise their wages, and lower prices all at the same time. And this is quite often the case when privately owned businesses become worker cooperatives. You can see the same thing in a movie from 2004 called The Take, where Argentinian workers took over factories abandoned by their owners and had similar results. Spanish tenant farmers did the same in agricultural lands, confiscating and redistributing the land of aristocrats to all the landless farmers and collectivizing them into communes. Farmers who wanted to own their new land individually were allowed to, so long as they didn't employ wage labor, as abolishing any form of dependent labor is supposed to be the whole point of socialism. However, very few people chose individual ownership, as the co-ops and communes offered huge advantages in terms of labor and resource sharing. In this way, workers and peasants managed to directly take control of about 50% of the lands inside the Republican zone, with 7 million people taking part in self-government, going up to 75% in the region of Catalonia, which includes the major city of Barcelona, where workers ran most of industry, from unions of small barber shops and bakers to textile factories and machinery factories, right up to the telecommunication systems, the trains, and the ambulances. 
And whereas state socialist governments like the Soviet Union often had the cities practically declaring war on the peasants, in anarchist Spain, cities and urban areas cooperated together via their unions and other anarchist organizations. These organizations also formed collectively owned and controlled banks, where all these communes, cooperatives, and collectives pooled their money and withdrew resources from each other in the form of products and services, where they bought supplies from abroad with cash. They implemented welfare benefits for the first time, like unemployment and sickness insurance, and they distributed goods and services to workers and families based on hours worked or according to need for those who couldn't work, and in some agricultural areas, even just on demand, like everything was just free, although that didn't work very well. At first, production ran into some chaos, as workers didn't have the experience to manage themselves or to do their own bookkeeping. Meanwhile, some wealthier collectivized workplaces were acting based on their individual interests, the way for-profit cooperatives do in capitalism. However, workers quickly learned how to manage themselves, and within a few weeks, industries were cooperating with each other via the broader anarchist organizations, and operating based on the needs of the whole society, not just the individual communes in competition with each other. As time went on, more and more shops, factories, and entire industries were collectivized, with more experienced workers teaching the newly collectivized ones management and bookkeeping. Workers and owners of small shops like bakeries and other small businesses often voluntarily dissolved their businesses into wider production facilities and co-ops to increase production, revenue, and working conditions. Within a few months, industrial productivity had doubled almost everywhere that the anarchists were in control, and agricultural production had increased by 30-50%. to 50%. And anarchist self-government wasn't just limited to the workplace, or the farm, or the economic sphere. Local, regional, and federal deliberative bodies were formed where people could speak and vote and formulate general policy. Decisions from lower bodies went up to an executive, whose job was to put into action what the lower bodies wanted them to do. Kind of like Occupy Wall Street, but actually making demands and doing things instead of just masturbating. And to defend their revolution from the fascist forces trying to restore their traditional order, they formed armed militias which were also run along socialist democratic principles. Soldiers elected their commanders, who had authority, but who were also subject to recall by their subordinates. Men and women fought together, or in separate units. Women even commanded some units, again, huge for a society like Spain in the 1930s. Despite lack of experience and a serious lack of resources, for example, these militias initially lacked basics like functioning rifles, they somehow managed to turn out to be an effective fighting force, to the shock of their own allies on the Republican side. This revolutionary socialist state of affairs continued with increasing success in different parts of the country for nine months to two years. Ultimately, however, the Republican side lost the Civil War, and Franco became dictator of Spain until he finally kicked that bucket in 1975. <laughs> But it wasn't Franco's forces that ended the anarchist revolution. Ironically, it was the supposed communists on the Republican side, who were controlled by the Soviet Union, who squelched the revolution, in exchange for Soviet aid and weapons. The fact that the anarchists were putting worker-controlled socialism directly into practice, without any party or bureaucratic dictatorship, was an existential threat to the Soviet system, which could not be tolerated. But because the anarchists and other forces did not have the necessary resources to win the war alone, they had to accept to be in coalition with the Spanish communists. And they more and more dominated the Republican side as it became increasingly dependent on Soviet assistance to fight the war. Over time, more and more anarchist zones had to give in to communist demands to dismantle the agricultural communes, to return control of workplaces to their former owners, or else to submit to government-appointed bosses and managers, and to subject anarchist zones to top-down government control. And thus, the communists ironically dismantled the entire socialist project in the name of socialism. As a result of their democracy being dismantled, despite being better equipped, the anarchist soldiers, workers, and peasants lost much of their zeal, dedication, and emotional investment in the war effort. Production slowed, and acts of military bravery were less forthcoming. Some historians argue that this was the major cause of the Republican loss. For the Soviets, who controlled the Republican coalition, it was better to lose Spain to the fascists than for anarchism to become a potentially successful model for socialism around the world. Okay, so in the past few episodes, we've seen that the different situations that people find themselves in, material, environmental, practical, result in different people having different levels of bargaining power. And this results in hierarchical or egalitarian societies.
And in this episode, we saw what type of conditions are more conducive or less conducive for human agency and to large-scale social change. When conditions change quickly or frequently, the potential balance of power often shifts without people knowing it. And with knowledge and organizing, people can join together to moderate or even eliminate existing hierarchies. Industrial civilizations have always been extremely hierarchical. But industrial civilizations have barely been around for 200 years, and conditions have been changing wildly and quickly ever since. And these changes happen at such an abstract level, involving millions and billions of people, that the shifts in potential bargaining power that come along with these changes aren't always as apparent as they tend to be in smaller scale societies or after drastic events like the Black Plague. What the anarchist revolution in Spain shows us is that it is eminently possible for an industrialized society to be run democratically with equality and freedom. You don't need capitalist owners or bosses to run industry from the top down. You don't need bureaucratic state elites to control planning and production or even to deliver services. In the next episode, we're going to look at one of the main forces of dominance hierarchy in our world today, and that is the particular regime of property rights, which is enforced to varying degrees by all states in the capitalist world. After all, the simple fact that one person can own or control resources that other people depend on to live is what makes dominance hierarchy possible in the first place, whether it's among hunter-gatherers in Papua New Guinea or in the industrialized West. So we'll look at different concepts of property in different societies across the world and across history, and we'll compare them to the regime of property rights that we live under today, which is basically the moral foundation of our economic system, and which is so deeply ingrained in our culture and in our minds that most of us can't even imagine a different concept of property. But before I do the What is Property episode, I'll be doing a big long Q&A episode to cover everything we've talked about up until now. Plus, I'll be doing short, too-long-did-not-read versions of each episode so that you can refer to them as a refresher or for you to send to family or friends that you might be having fruitless arguments with over the internet or else to introduce the concepts we've been talking about to busy people. And some cool news. I will be doing an interview on one of my favorite political podcasts, From Alpha to Omega, very soon. So if you want to hear me live, unscripted, and unhinged, do check that out. And check out the archives of that show, because there's so much good stuff in there, including a recent interview with anthropologist Chris Knight, who was talking about some of the same hunter-gatherer stuff that I've been discussing and making similar critiques of David Graeber's work on equality. And I'm also going to be doing co-interviews with the Fight Like an Animal podcast in the not-too-distant future. And he's been approaching some of the same problems and topics that we've been talking about here, but from a different angle. And it's a really wonderful podcast, also in my top favorites. So definitely check out the back catalog of that. The first few episodes cover some similar anthropology ground, and the show is full of great stories and original perspectives. In the meantime, if you have any questions, critiques, corrections, or comments, send them to worldwidescroats at gmail.com, or post them on the YouTube videos, and most likely I will answer you. And if this podcast makes you feel your galaxy brain glowing and burning away all the gunk in your head, please, please, please share this with your friends and social networks and rate and review it on Herple Podcasts because it helps more people find it. And if you can afford to, please subscribe to the What Is Politics Patreon so I can keep making this. Because it usually takes so long to produce an episode, I'm currently charging per episode and not per month, and you won't get charged more than 12 times a year maximum. Until next time, see ya!